Hey everybody, welcome to part three of this series, What Happened to Fred? As I've mentioned in the previous two videos, as I've bumped into people over the last year and a half, I've had many people ask how I'm doing, and I'm gonna cover that in the second part of this video series. But in this first half, I'm answering the question, what happened? Because if I've sat down and had coffee with people, a lot of people have asked, what happened. And so in part one of what happened to Fred, I covered insomnia. In the last video, I talked about Xanax and alcohol as it pertained to insomnia. In this third part, I want to talk a little bit about ministry burnout and marriage. And so just to talk about ministry burnout a little bit, some of you may not know this, but Pastoring is a stressful job and seminaries across the country and seminaries have traditionally trained pastors for full-time ministry across the United States, both denominational and non-denominational seminaries across the United States and really around the world. And so seminaries have kept track of how pastors do once they get out of seminary. And what they found out, and these statistics are a bit old, I haven't read stuff that's updated it in say the last 10 or 15 years, but, but I imagine it's not too far off of these percentages, but seminaries found out that within three years after a seminary graduate goes into full-time pastoral ministry, about three, about, I'm sorry, about, about 50% of the pastors will be out of the ministry within three years of graduating from seminary. So three years, about 50% of people in the ministry drop out of the ministry and find some other career track. It wasn't for them or they burned out quickly or the pressures or stresses got to them quickly, that kind of a thing. So then if you go to the tenure mark, seminary graduates, the tenure mark, roughly about 75% of the pastors are out of the ministry at the 10 year mark. So I was ordained when I was 18 and I started preaching then, I started doing ministry then, but I wasn't full-time pastor. I went through college and then I went through seminary. And when I graduated from seminary, I took my first full-time pastor job in Hampton, Virginia. And I was out there for three years. And then I moved to Kansas City in 1990 and that's when I started Vineyard Church. And that was my third into my fourth year of full-time ministry. Now, another thing we know is that church planting, which is what I did in Kansas City in 1990, I started a church. Church planting takes a special skill set. Not every pastor in America, there's about 350,000 churches in America. Most of those churches aren't pastored by the church planters who planted those churches, okay? So church planting is a specific skill set. And we train church planters and work with church planters. And we had an interview system based on past history, past performance, that kind of thing that, that really evaluated 12 characteristics of a church planter. And the tricky thing about church planting, especially if you do it like I did it, where you don't have a core group, you don't have a budget, you don't have anything, facilities, anything like that. It takes a unique skill set. Most church plants don't make it. So way more than 50% of church plants fail. And a large part of that is because the person trying to plant the church isn't really gifted to be a church planter. It's a unique skill set. It's an entrepreneurial skill set. If you think about it, you got to be able to reach people so that evangelism, reaching new people kind of a dynamic is important. You also have to be able to disciple and build people. You have to train people. You have to equip people for all kinds of volunteer roles and ministry roles. You know, you don't have any buildings. You don't have any facilities. I didn't have any money. I had to raise my own support. I had to reach out to people that weren't involved in churches and try to reach new people and then try to disciple them and then try to help them grow and develop into their gifts and services and all those kinds of things. And, and like, it took me two years to reach 50 people. And then after we started meeting on Sunday mornings at Lakeview Middle School in Kansas City, Missouri with 50 people, 
the church grew faster at that point. But the skill sets, I mean, we didn't, we didn't have a, I, I filed for the nonprofit 501c3 status. I built my board. I developed the financial systems and the volunteer systems and the leadership systems and the new member systems and the small group systems. Every system that you think of that you need to function as an organization or an organism I had to build those. And so that skill set is pretty broad. And a lot of church planters don't do well, even if they successfully plant the church, they don't do well as it grows. So I had to develop new skill sets as the church grew. And so pastoring a church of 50 people is a different skill set than pastoring a church of 200 people. Pastoring a church of 400 people is a different skill set than pastoring a church of 200 people. Pastoring a church of 800 people is different than 400. 2,000 is different than 800. And so at every point as the church grew, I had to grow in my leadership giftings, my abilities. And uh, pretty soon I'm leading a multi-million dollar nonprofit organization with a large staff. And so, and I had to learn how to grow through all of those as we were reaching people and growing and reaching people and growing and, and seeing that kind of dynamic go on. So ministry burnout is high, whether you're a pastor of 50, a pastor of 100, a pastor of 200, a pastor of 1,000, a pastor of several thousand, ministry burnout is high in the pastoral world. Being the point person, the lead pastor, being a church planter, uh, being a pastor of a growing church in that lead position, that even increases the potential for burnout. And so I was an at-risk person just by nature of what I was doing. And what I found is I pastored. And again, I was at Vineyard Church for 28 years. I was a pastor full-time prior to that for three years. And I was preaching and teaching and doing pastoral ministry even before that for the last 40 plus years. And so what I found out is that number one, Preaching itself can be stressful. Even if you love, if you, even if you're an extrovert and love the attention, which I was more of an introvert, I felt gifted to preach and teach, but I, I, I had that social nervousness about being in front of people that I had to overcome. But, but that bullet comes at you every week and you have to prepare. And if you're preaching over the long haul, like I was, to come up with fresh material over and over and over again and to be sharp and, and competent, all that takes an enormous amount of work when you're doing the primary preaching load for a growing congregation. Most of your week is devoted to sermon preparation and to delivering that message because we have multiple services on the weekend. A secondary thing to that for me was the whole deal of people's expectations. You, you can't make your own self happy all the time, let alone you and your spouse or you and your partner or you and your kids or, or you and your friends. You can't make anybody happy all the time. And when you start pastoring a whole large group of people and all of their idiosyncrasies and all of their beliefs and all of their, their problems and issues, you're never going to make even five people happy all the time. And so there's constantly this idea of where you're managing expectations, people have expectations in you as a pastor. You constantly disappoint people with their expectations. This can create senses of guilt feelings or gosh, I'm not doing a good job or I'm always disappointing people. There's an emotional dynamic to that. Another thing is rejection because people come and go in the church world today. I'm, I know I mentioned earlier, one of my mentors said he felt like he was preaching to a parade. Like people are just coming and going, coming and going. It's like you just capture a group of people in the moment, weekend to weekend, but people come and go and come and go. And some people leave poorly. Some people make a big scene of it, you know. So managing that component is is a rejection issue. That's an emotional issue. Think about conflict as you get staff members and pastors and other interacting with hundreds of people, thousands of people sometimes. Just two people together in the same room over the long haul, like marriage is going to equal conflict to some degree or another. So managing conflict becomes a big deal. And there's healthy ways to manage conflict. There's unhealthy ways to manage conflict. So that's an emotional 
stressor. And then on top of that, you've got money that you're always thinking about. Churches are always short on money. Nonprofits always need more money. Nonprofits always need more volunteers. And so you're constantly managing money, volunteers, budgets, numbers, all that stuff. All of that goes into ministry burnout. Now, I had had ministry burnout many times before uh, this huge meltdown I had in my life. I I had periodic ministry burnout. But normally, I, if I got out of town for two or three weeks, got into the mountains, did some hiking, camping, talked with some friends, that was enough for me to get through my burnout. But in 2016, I was finishing up classwork on a PhD. Our church was larger than it had ever been. We were, we were having larger numbers than we'd ever had. My staff was bigger than it had ever been. We were managing thousands of people. Uh, I was finishing PhD work, so this was a second doctorate that I was finishing up. And then I went through some, some conflict issues that I had to manage that cost me hundreds and hundreds of hours every week, it seemed like. I was just pouring in extra hours all the time, all the way through most of 2016. And that, that added pressure. So think about my normal pressures, it's Christmas to Easter and then finishing a PhD class load and then moving into some management of conflict that I had to do that cost me extra hours on top of what I was already doing on top of the PhD program that I was already doing. I was just running too thin. And I'd say by about September of 2016, I was in the biggest, I was in the biggest ministry burnout that I'd ever been in. And I really probably should have taken some type of sabbatical right then. I had never taken a three month sabbatical. I'd never taken a one year sabbatical. A lot of my colleagues at the 10 year mark or the 20 year mark or the 25 year mark had taken either three month or even one year sabbaticals where they just got away and replenished. And I, I underestimated uh, how big a deal it was and how big of a burnout I was in and how low I had gone. I just figured if I kept going, I'd bounce out of it just like I always had. And I did start thinking about a sabbatical, but I pushed it out on my calendar to like 2018 because of all the different things that were going on in our church at the time. We were in a building program, fundraising, all this kind of stuff. And so... I just put it off and I literally from the fall of 2016, I would say all the way into the fall of 2017 was just on ministry burnout. I, I honestly didn't feel like preaching, but I was just going through the motions. I was trying to do my best. I was showing up. I was doing the work, but man, I was on fumes and I really, really, really didn't feel like doing ministry during that time frame. So if you think through last talk that I did on Xanax and alcohol and that how that dovetails with this ministry burnout in 2016, you can kind of see here this perfect storm that's beginning to align and how that was impacting my life. So while I'm experiencing the worst ministry burnout I've ever experienced, on top of that, I was trying to deal with my insomnia through Xanax and through now alcohol in 2016. And so all of this is just creating a perfect storm. There are things you go through you can't always power through. And you can't always bounce back from just everything. So I want to thank you for tuning into this video. And particularly if you're a pastor and you're listening to this, I want to encourage you to access the resources that you have available to you. And just know your own personal limitations don't hit bottom and melt down like I did before you realize that you do have limitations. And I guess that's my big error. So thanks for tuning in. I'm praying for you and thank you for praying for me and walking through this journey with me. God bless you.